Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us today for An Elderly Mother and an Aging Son, a journalist caregiving story. Uh, I'm Calvin with Family Caregiver Alliance. And before we get started, I'd just like to say a few words about our organization. Um, Family Caregiver Alliance has been working in the Bay Area and the nation to improve the well being and the quality of life for family caregivers. And we offer support by providing a number of services and resources, most at no cost, which include consultations, classes, workshops, publications, and we also do advocacy work both locally and nationally. So to learn more about Family Caregiver Alliance, please visit us at caregiver.org. Now your phones and mics are gonna be muted, and I'm also gonna be asking you to give a little bit of feedback at the end of the webinar. So I'd like to thank you all in advance for filling that out. For those of you who are familiar with Family Caregiver Alliance webinars, this one's gonna be a little bit different. Our guest today, Dave Iverson, has recently written, written a book, Winter Stars, which is about his decade-long journey, um, caregiving journey. So today we're gonna to be having a bit of a conversation with Dave about his book and also kind of how he navigated the challenges of caregiving. And we're gonna have Q&A at the end of the webinar as normal, but please share your comments, reactions, questions or observations in the chat box and ask your questions uh, by using the Q&A box on your screen to participate in the conversation. So now for some background on our guest, um, you've got a bio right here, but I'll just summarize it briefly. Dave Iverson is a writer. He is a documentary film producer and director. He's a retired broadcast journalist, and he's produced and reported more than 20 documentary specials for PBS, which includes his frontline film, My Father, Brother, and Me, which explored his family's battle with Parkinson's and also capturing Grace, which tells the story of what happened when a group of people with Parkinson's disease joined forces with a legendary New York City dance company. Dave was a radio and television host for nearly 40 years, first at Wisconsin Public Broadcasting. I know we've gotten a question about that um, in the questions, and also San Francisco's NPR affiliate KQED. So following his Parkinson diagnosis in 2004, he became founding member of the Michael J. Fox uh, Foundation's Patient Council. So now that you know more about our guest, I'd like to turn things over to Dave, who's gonna get started by reading a passage from his book. And then I'm gonna take these um, slides off the screen for now. Thank you, Calvin. Um, and good morning or good afternoon, everyone, depending on where you might be joining us today. It's, um, it's a great pleasure to be here, to be part of this uh, Family Caregiver, Caregiver Alliance um, webinar. And I'm, I'm really pleased to, to be here. And, Look forward to both telling you something about my story, but also hearing more about yours in the conversation that I hope we can have towards the end of the webinar, um, because each of our stories um, is so so different, you know. And I think it's important for us to to hear and listen to each other. Um, I'd like to start out by just reading a short passage uh, from the book. Um, this is from the prologue uh, to the book. Um, it begins with a scene that took place about um, six years after I'd moved in with my mom. I'd moved in with her when she was the age of 59, and uh, I was 59 rather, and she was the age of, uh, uh, age of, of 95. Um, and this scene takes place about six years later when her dementia was really starting to advance, something that I had noticed and the caregivers who helped me had noticed. But what we didn't realize is that my mom, uh, Adelaide, um, had, had noticed too. And so this is, uh, this is where um, uh, the prologue to the book begins. In the fall of 2013, I walked into the kitchen of my mom's house in Menlo Park, California. She was 101 years old and the early stages of dementia were beginning to take hold. She looked up at me and said, David, I think there are two Adelaides. There's the good Adelaide, the one who's pretty and smart and knows how to do things. And there's the bad Adelaide, the one who's ugly and stupid and can't do anything. I'm not sure which one is here right now, she said, but I think it's the bad Adelaide. My mom had always been a force. She graduated from high school at age 16, from college at age 20, and at the top of her class in both. She'd been a teacher, a devoted spouse, a mother of three, a passionate sports fan, a loyal friend, and a powerhouse volunteer. 
When she was 94, she'd thrown out the first pitch at a Stanford baseball game. At 96, she made phone calls in her own very distinctive manner in support of Barack Obama. But now the long arc of her remarkable life was turning in a new direction. And yet she'd been able to describe that with searing precision and without tears. She was like that. She didn't blink, confronting most challenges with a firm, no-nonsense demeanor. No one ever trifled with Adelaide Iverson, and that included me. I'd moved in with my mom six years before. After my dad had died, she'd lived independently for 13 years, but when she turned 95, she'd had a difficult bout with pneumonia and couldn't manage fully on her own. I was a broadcaster and filmmaker living in nearby San Francisco at the time. My life was full, but flexible, and it didn't take much deliberation to decide. It just made sense for me to move in and help. But there was so much I did not know. I didn't know that I'd become so exhausted. I didn't know I'd be capable of getting so angry. I didn't know I'd be tested in ways I'd never imagined or rewarded in ways I'd never dreamed. I didn't know that someone with dementia can be poetic or that I'd get proficient at transferring my mom from bed to commode and back again, but never quite mastered the intimate skill of changing diapers. I didn't know I'd be joined and strengthened by remarkable women caregivers who became my teachers, my comrades, and my kin or that the Parkinson's I'd been diagnosed with a few years before would actually present fewer challenges than being a caregiver. And I never imagined that after I moved back in, my mom would live for another full decade before passing away at the age of 105. Our 10 year caregiving odyssey affected me, humbled me and reoriented me more than any other life experience. And during that decade together, my mom and I drew closer, I'd like to think, both to each other and to our truest selves. This is the story of our journey and of the remarkable women who accompanied us and changed both our lives. Thanks, Dave, for sharing that passage and kind of giving us a little bit of taste of your mother and um, the idea of your journey. Uh, I guess some things that pop into mind are if you could give maybe a bit of a snapshot of what your situation was when you started providing care to your mother. And you mentioned that it didn't take a lot of deliberation to decide to take on this fairly important role. So I was wondering maybe if you could also speak to that on what your thought process was. Sure. I know it almost seems, I even refer to it in the book as a 10 second decision, which which seems sort of ridiculous when you think about it. Um, and, and yet that was true. I really did feel like, well, this is something that, that I can do. And, and I think that shows both naivete, obviously, um, but also sort of bravado, you know, like, well, of course I can do this. Um, in an odd way, that's probably kind of useful because I think if I'd known everything I came to know, I might not have made that choice. I wouldn't have been challenged in the way I was challenged. I also wouldn't have been rewarded in the way I think I was as well. Some people wonder also about, well, how in the world did you decide this after you'd recently been diagnosed with Parkinson's? And as many of you in this audience probably know, Parkinson's is a very individual condition. It's idiosyncratic. Um, My late father and my late brother both had Parkinson's too, had much tougher time than I did. I've been extraordinarily fortunate and continue to do um, quite well. That's thanks to a great neurologist, to good care, to support from my wife and family, um, to being obsessive about exercise, (laughs) but mostly just being lucky. But I will say also, um, as part of an answer to your question, Calvin, that part of why I moved in was because I wanted to feel like I could. You know, I think sometimes if you have a condition yourself, you want to feel useful. You want to feel like you can still do things. And I felt like this was something I could do. And I'm and I'm and I'm grateful for that. 
And I also want to say, in answer to your question, that I was extraordinarily fortunate. I had wonderful caregivers right from the beginning who could help me during the day while I was at work. And then I would come over, come come back to the house at night and be there through the night um, and on the weekend and, and do the best I could. But I had wonderful uh, support. And I and I and I think, as we'll talk more later in the program, um, I I also learned quite soon that I really wasn't ready for all of this. You know, we it's funny to me. We we think so much about what it takes to become a parent. You know, we read up on it. We go to websites. We talk to our friends excitedly about becoming a parent. But I don't think anybody thinks very much about caring for a parent. And while no one's ready fully to be a parent. I don't know as anyone is really ready to care for a parent. Um, and that became uh, evident to me early on uh, and, and revealed to me um, so many things about my own shortcomings uh, as a caregiver uh, that I would learn from over time. And I look forward to talking more about some of those topics as, as we proceed today. Thanks, Dave. And actually, we have a comment who said um, very powerful reading. So I've, of course, um, read some excerpts from uh, Dave's books. I know his skill is a wordsmith, but it's nice to have someone um, have that skill come out as a presenter. Your other um, your other career as a broadcast, uh, as a journalist and a producer is, is pretty clear. Now, we have um, something that came to mind while you're reading that passage, though, is that you mentioned getting exhausted and kind of even angry. Um, maybe frustrated. So, I mean, I guess, do you have any specific examples you could share with us of kind of, you know, maybe, um, maybe having these lesser, these feelings that maybe we don't want to acknowledge come to the forefront? No, I, uh, thank you, Calvin, for raising that point. It's a really good question. And I think all of everyone who is part of this conversation today as a caregiver um, knows this feeling. You get, you, you get frustrated, you can get angry. Um, I would say a lot of that for me came from perhaps two things. Um, one is how relentless caregiving is in a way, you know, it's always there, no matter what. You can think you have a great plan for the day um, and you might, uh, but that plan is not likely to stay true as you go forward, not this day or any other day, you know, you figure something out and that solution worked fine until it no longer worked, you know, and, and so constantly being able to adjust, I think is something that's, you're called upon to do. I used to sometimes say it's a bit like being a, a, a jazz musician, which I definitely was not, you know, there's sort of a call and response and you have to be able to adjust and ad lib and improvise. Um, so that's part of the challenge. Some of it is just pure exhaustion. You know, um, I'd always been a pretty good sleeper, but it wasn't safe for my mom to go to the bathroom on her own. And so I, and I would usually hear her when she'd get up but sometimes not. I sometimes miss that telltale thud when her walker would, would hit the hardwood floor to my bedroom next door. And so after a while I installed a bell and so she could ring the bell when she needed to get up, which she did. And sometimes she did often, <laughs> you know, there were, I used to call them three bell nights when, when we would go through that. And so you get worry, weary of that and you get frustrated by that. And especially with someone who has advancing dementia, you can get angry or you can, you feel like you're always correcting that person or reminding that person. And it's, which is almost never the right thing to do, but I, I succumb to that many, many times. Um, that, and that, and I would, and I would, and I would get cross with a mom because she could be cross, you know, she would be frustrated too. And she could be snappish. Um, so I'd, I'd, let me read one short excerpt um, about a specific incident that happened after I'd been living with my mom for a few years. And she'd always been the host of family gatherings throughout my life. But in time, she ceded that role uh, to my wonderful Aunt Alice, who was my dad's much younger sister. So she would host things. And so one day we were going out to my Aunt Alice's for a family gathering. And, um, and my mom was cross from the get-go. Um, so I'll pick up um, with, with what happened next. My mom wasn't happy, snapping at people and responding crossly when one of us tried to respond to her grievances. 
Over the next hour, I find myself getting more and more irritated. Finally, I stepped over and said, exactly as you would to a four-year-old, if you can't act better, we're going home. A few minutes later, we headed for the dinner table. I didn't know you could stalk across the floor while using a walker, but my mom did. My aunt asked her where she wanted to sit and my mom snapped at her again. That's it, I said, we're going home. I steered her out of the room, out of the doorway and into the car. We drove home in silence. When we, were, when we arrived back at the house, I ushered her into her bedroom with hands as comforting as steel. She stood next to her bed for a moment, gripping her walker, and then she just collapsed onto the bed. I hate myself, she wailed. And here's the thing, I didn't say a word. I didn't feel anything other than a cold sense of satisfaction. I was acting like a self-righteous parent who'd appropriately reprimanded a bratty kid, but now a repentant child. And as I look back, I don't think I fully took in what my mom was really saying. I think now that when she said she hated herself, she meant exactly that. She hated who she was becoming, hated the sense that she was increasingly trapped in a world where she could no longer be who she had always been, including the person who had always hosted family gatherings. My mom's wail was from the heart, but sometimes I felt like my own heart had turned cold. You know, with the benefit of time, um, just hearing the passage, it sounds like there's maybe some, there's some feelings of regret or maybe self-recrimination. Do you think you might have uh, dealt with the situation slightly differently with cooler heads? Or is it just kind of one of those moments that, you know, it kind of is what it is. We are all human. And unfortunately, sometimes we, we might act in ways we don't necessarily um, think are the best ways. Yeah, no, exactly, Calvin. Well, it was important to me to try to tell this story in an honest and, and hopefully unvarnished way. Because um, carrying a pig is unvarnished, you know, it's, uh, it's a kind of gritty experience. Um, and there's great beauty in that. And we will talk about that some as well. But there's, there are tough times, too. And um, you know, a friend of mine who, who read the book uh, once said to me, you know, Dave, you, you, you write in the book about the, the two Adelaides, the, the good Adelaide and the bad Adelaide. But my friend said after reading the book, he decided there was a good Dave and a bad Dave. Um, and that's true. You know, it's undoubtedly true uh, for all of us. I guess I'd say what I've, I learned over time was to accept that to accept my own weaknesses. Caregiving reveals your weaknesses like nothing else. Um, I sometimes say that if, you, if there's a silver lining to caregiving, if, and that's if you, if you want to improve parts of your caregiving, or parts of your character, then, then caregiving will, will give you a, a head start on that. But it's learning to accept that, learning to know that even though you feel remorse at that, as I did, that, that, that night and the next morning, that you may well do it again, you know? And you have to accept that, um, accept that as well. And I would also say one thing I came to really believe, and I suspect everyone on this call may identify with, is that, you know, all caregivers realize in time that they need more help. And all of us realized that later than we should. <laughs> and so part of my awareness over time was that I needed more help. Um, I needed more than just the 30 hours a week that I started out with. I needed to get a night off now and again, uh, and in time, a whole weekend off, um, because that's important too. People like to say, well, you can't take care of anyone else unless you take care of yourself. Well, that's, that's really not true at all. Caregivers, everyone I bet listening knows that you, you've cared for someone 
often at the expense of caring your, for yourself. That's just how it is. But we need to be reminded of that and to do better at that. Uh, if you're going to sustain this journey over the, the long haul, the long distance run that, that, that caregiving often is. Well, that was a really long answer, Calvin, to your question. <laughs> but um, yeah, I have regret. I also, I think, have acceptance now um, and, and peace with all that the caregiving experience is, um, both the hard times and, and the great and the great beauty that there is as well. You know, you mentioned in the prologue and also just now about the kind of 30 hours of um, pay, um, caregivers you had to help you out, that there were some remarkable women who kind of became your teachers. And I was wondering, were these uh, female relatives, were they friends, were they professional paid caregivers? In some ways, all of the above. I had wonderful support from, from friends um, and, and family too, um, but most of it came from paid professional caregivers. And I was fortunate in that way, um, Calvin, and maybe we can talk about that some, because I was extremely lucky to be able to afford that care. As we all know, caregiving, paid professional caregiving is very expensive. Um, my mom had an, an okay retirement um, uh, and income, and, and that helped to a degree. Um, we could share expenses by my moving in together and you know pay the light bill and groceries and all of that. That helped. Uh, but my folks also had a great nest egg. Um, my parents had bought a house in Menlo Park, California in 1950 for $15,000. Well, needless to say, by the time I moved in in 2007, it was worth just a little bit more than that. And so we could borrow against the house. Um, and we did that for um, uh, through most of the time that I was a caregiver. And then, in fact, I, I was able to secure an additional family loan, thanks to some wonderful friends, to help again. So we could borrow against um, that. Um, and that's what allowed us to, to be able to have pay givers. But I would love to tell you a little bit more about um, some of them. Um, they were all immigrant uh, women in the South Bay, at least. There's a, a Pacific Islander community that is frequently uh, uh, provides a lot of that professional caregiving assistance. They were extraordinary. Um, and I am so and will be enduringly grateful to them for what they helped what they taught me, not only in terms of caregiving, but also the challenges you face when you are a paid caregiver, because you don't make a lot of money. I was fortunate I could pay them more than, than many caregivers get paid because of my circumstances. But it's not an easy life. Most of them work two jobs. Um, so I'd like to read to you a little bit more about, about them um, and, and about the kind of women they were. Um, Two in particular were lifesavers to me, Eileen Khan and Sanai Latu. Um, and so I'd like to read you a little bit about them and our other caregivers who supported us. Caregiving deepened my perspectives on the stories I sometimes covered on the radio, like immigration. Until I became a caregiver, I hadn't had good friends who'd had to work two jobs or sleep on the floor in order to make ends meet. I hadn't seen the skill and compassion it takes to attend to someone else's most basic needs and do so with tenderness and ease. And I hadn't really understood, at least not in such an intimate way, the additional challenges you face when your last name is Taufa, Morales, Khan, or Latu, when your skin is brown and English is your second or third language. Their lives told a different story than the talk shows I sometimes hosted on KQED. Eileen and Sanai, along with Mele and Ronette, enhanced my life every bit as much as they enhanced my mom's. It surprised me how enriching and important those relationships quickly became. And when unexpected kindness enters your life at a time when you need it most, it washes over your very being, releasing a wave of gratitude that can carry you through the great swirls of uncertainty that so often surround you. You begin to realize that you are not entirely alone, not what someone offers the simple 
but extraordinary act of just being there when it's needed most. Thank you, Dave. I want to take just a quick pause and um, read out some of the comments we've been getting. Um, first, we have someone who mentioned that they applaud you for sharing your caregiving, uh, your experience with caregiving. Uh, another listener who can relate so well, double exclamation, single exclamation point. Um, another caregiver who wants to share that they can't stop crying as you're hitting the nail on the head to my experience of caring for my beautiful, wonderful, loving, and yes, frustrating mother. Thank you, all caps, double exclamation point. And then we have another caregiver who wanted to um, mention that it's raw and real. Thank you for sharing your experience. Uh, your compassion is still present even as you're speaking about your experience right now. And then another listener, I understand you. Uh, I understand and have many similar experiences. Uh, someone chiming in, I have struggled to get caregivers that understand and have compassion. Finally, I have a couple of women who are wonderful, mentioning uh, Eileen and uh, Sinai. So um, moving Thank right you. on, I think um, I'd like to switch gears for a moment and ask, uh, having been caregiving to someone living with dementia, your mother, which uh, many people consider kind of the most challenging type of caregiving because of the cognitive challenges, can you offer any insight on how to manage dealing with the ups and downs that can occur with that type of caregiving? Yeah. Yeah, well, the first thing I would say is that it took me a long time, way too long, to realize that correcting and reminding wasn't really very useful. Um, you know, I said before that caregiving reveals your weaknesses. And one of mine is wanting to be right. You know, I, I like being right. Uh, and I, and I, and I, I'm, I'm sorry to say, uh, like explaining why I'm why I'm right, um, and so you know when my mom would say something wrong, uh, or was confused, or would repeat something on and on again about something that had happened that had not happened, I my first for too long I would just correct and remind, and and um, it took me way too long to realize that. You know, we, we, we sometimes say, well, well, everyone's entitled to their own opinions, but not their own set of facts. But I think with dementia, actually, people do have their own set of facts because it may not be true from our point of view, but something they're saying may be, may be really true to them. And here's an example. Once I came home from my work day and I walked in and, I, and my mom looked at me and she said, David, you won't believe what happened to me today. And I said, okay, what? And she said, well, I was left in the bathroom for hours and hours. And I knew right away that couldn't possibly be the case. And so I, you know, I said, well, mom, you know, you weren't, uh, our caregiver would never leave you in the bathroom. Oh yes, no, I was left there for hours and hours. And I, I just, you know, I, finally I just said, well, if you want, I'll, I'll, I'll try to find out what happened. So of course I, I, I did. And, and our caregiver said, well, I helped your mom into the bathroom and I left her there. So she'd have some privacy for a minute or two. And when I came back in, she, she'd fallen asleep. She was dozing. So I just let her rest for a while. And then after that, I gently woke her up. So we can look at that experience as well, she didn't, wasn't left in the bathroom for hours and hours. Or we can, what I finally started being able to try to understand was, from her point of view, it probably felt something like this. She was in the bathroom. All of a sudden she became alert and was startled and felt like I, I must've been left here for hours. Sort of like when you wake up suddenly at night and you and you feel like you've been asleep for hours, only only it's maybe only been a few minutes. And so I think one of the things I would try to say is that it's really as best we can, if we can try to be present to that person and be right there and hear them and accept who they are, 
rather than who we might want them to be, you know, that that really is important. I wish I had understood that sooner. I know we can't always do that, but I think to just be present to that person and to be present to that person's reality and to, and have that be our starting point rather than our starting point is important. And so um, I'd like to read a, another excerpt about a time when I at least tried to do better. And some of that was remembering something that the, the great Michael J. Fox uh, once said. And he said this about um, a rule he learned as an actor, that when you're an actor, you learn that you have to play the scene you're in. You have the script, you know how, you know how the play ends or how the movie ends, but you can't act that way. You have, to, you have to play the scene you're in. And it seems to me that's also, and, he, and then Michael goes on to say that that's important advice for anyone living with Parkinson's. You have to play the scene you're in. You know where this disease is gonna go, but you can't act like that. You gotta play the scene you're in. I think the same is true for living with someone with dementia. You have to play the scene you're in. So this is a story about, about um, how I, how I, I uh, one wonderful day that my mom and I had together um, when, I, when I drove her to the ocean. My mom had always loved the ocean. We'd taken the same drive as a family for 60 years over La Honda Road, heading towards Highway 1. When I was a kid, we'd always compete to who could spot the ocean first. Today, as we approached the old San Gregorio General Store, the ocean came into view a mile or so away, but my mom wasn't able to see it. So I said, I have to keep my eyes on the road, mom. So, so let me know when you see the ocean. And as we got closer, when we were all, just about a hundred feet from the water, she said, I see it. And a wide smile creased her face. We were at the point when I wanted us both to savor those moments, precisely because I knew they would not last. The moments can't be banked or reclaimed later when you need a good moment credit. And as we drove towards the ocean on this beautiful spring day, I tried to remember to do better, to just play the scene I was in, to take in the joy I saw in her face, precisely because it would only be experienced then. For her, there wouldn't necessarily be a later savoring. I tried to remember that moments are to be treasured because they do not last. Like a cloud pushed by the wind, Moments part as they become. As always, we pulled to a stop at Pescadero State Beach, our ocean destination for the past 60 years. No one in my family knows why that's true. Bean Hollow, a few miles further south, is prettier. Pomponio, a few miles to the north, affords longer walks along the cliffs. But Pescadero is home. We pulled into the parking lot just south of the beach because it offers the best view. We sat and we watched and we were quiet. And after a while, I happened to notice that the children's book, the little engine that could, was parked on the back seat. I'd recently purchased one to read to my three-year-old granddaughter. I don't know why, but I asked my mom if she wanted me to read it to her, and she said yes. Maybe because she liked the title, since she was like the little engine. She always thought she could too. And she was deeply annoyed when events transpired to obstruct her daily mission. You get up in the morning, you do what needs to be done for the good of the family and the good of society, and you do not stop. For my mom, getting old didn't include giving herself a pass. Accepting limitations was not part of her DNA. It was her greatest strength, and now sometimes, the source of her greatest sorrow. But in that moment, I read her a story. And together, we took in the sound of the words, the wind, and the waves. Me. It's pretty out here today, isn't it? Adelaide. I like what's covering me. Me. Do you mean the blanket? Adelaide, 
I mean the sky. Thank you, Dave. We have some more comments from listeners. Um, one listener wants to say amen on savoring each moment. Remember, remember to be as present as possible. And another listener who wanted to mention that uh, they're grateful to be here today. Uh, the shared experience is definitely raw and each one rings a bell with me. I must now leave this presentation to be present with my dear wife who needs my 24 seven care. I have some help, but now realize it is okay to seek more help. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So we thank them for participating with us today and mm -hmm. sharing their time. Mm -hmm. um, Often, may I just add yeah, one, yeah. perhaps in part to that person who just said that, um, we so need a better national plan in this country to provide support for caregivers and those who are being cared for. We can't just do the best we can based on whatever resources we might be lucky to not have. I was incredibly lucky, and yet it was still the hardest thing I've probably done. And so many people don't have those resources. We must do better as a country. You know, we just must. We can't have our plan B. We'll have your parents buy a home in Menlo Park in 1950. You know, that'll take care of it. We have to do better than that. We have to urge our elected representatives to attend to this problem, not only for those of us who are caregivers, but also so that we can reward those who do this work. Ajahn Pu, the, the leader of the, the uh, National Domestic Workers Alliance uh, says, you know, care is the work that makes all other work possible, whether that's child care providers or elder care providers. We have to do better. We just have to do better. Uh, you know, Dave, since you brought it up, um, and this is a little bit off the cuff, and I know you're part of Michael J. Fox's foundation, but I was wondering if you had any tips or strategies on caregivers advocating for themselves as maybe policymakers or legislators, or maybe even the workplace in terms of techniques or approaches that you might have found more or less beneficial as your time being a caregiver and also an advocate, I know, for uh, Parkinson's. Yeah, no, thank you for asking that, Calvin. I mean, your own organization, you know, the, the uh, FCA um, is, is one of those um, organizations um, that does that. Uh, Ajahn Pu's organization, the National um, Domestic Workers Alliance, um, is another. The Michael J. Fox uh, Foundation has a, is advocating on behalf, uh, behalf of, of caregivers. The Fox Foundation focuses on raising money to, to speed Parkinson's research, but they also want to make life better for those living with Parkinson's right now or for those caring for someone with Parkinson's right now. They have an active advocacy arm uh, uh, lobbying uh, Congress and, and any of these organizations, I would encourage people to get involved with. And also just to tell our story, you know, this is sort of an invisible quiet crisis, elder care in this country. We don't talk about it enough. We should talk um, and, and, I, um, and we should call our Congress people. You know, for those of us living in California, we're, we have a, a congressional delegation that's largely supportive of these challenges. But, you know, age and caregiving and need shouldn't be about party lines. It crosses party lines. We're all going to get old, whether we're red or blue, you know, we're all going to need care. We're all going to need to provide care. This could be in, in my best moments, I'd like to think a way in which our country could come back together a little bit and realize that we're all in it together, that, that we're all each other's business, you know, um, and, and we need to think of it um, that way. Thanks, Dave. We have a follow-up comment. Wanted to say thank you for the push to providing a better way at the government level. We can, be, we can become involved at a state level in making, oops, sorry, the comment just state level and making better uh, and making life better for those being cared for and those giving care. Reach out, tell your story, and spread awareness to your senators. Indeed. 
So, you know, I'm looking at the time with a little bit, uh, a tinge a, amount of regret, and I know we're fast running out of time, but there's one passage that I know you've shared with me, and I was hoping we might be able to get, be able to um, get to that one before we get into the Q&A about okay. a, a memory of the last Christmas you shared with your, your mother. Yeah, thank you, Calvin. Um, yeah, this is about a really, again, a really beautiful moment that I was able to share with my mom, and I, I, and I know I'm fortunate that I had the, the beauty along with the, the hard times. And I, I hope for everyone, those experiences can include um, both. And I also believe they, they go hand in hand. You don't get joy without sorrow. And hopefully you don't get sorrow without some joy too. Um, this is the, the last Christmas that my mom was alive. My mom was always someone who was very restless and always wanted to go uh, do things and, and that never stopped even the last year of her life when she was confined to a hospital bed she she always wanted to to stay in motion and to do what she she could and that was intensely hard for her it was hard for her to 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 ever be at peace but this is about a night when when that moment at least for that moment happened I knew right away when I walked into her room on that December night that my mom was in a different place. There wasn't any restlessness. She just seemed quiet and calm. She looked to be quite remarkably at peace. We sat there for a long time, just holding hands, and I felt a wave of tenderness come over me. And after a while, my mom looked up at me and said in a voice that was soft and only slightly slurred, you look wonderful. And I told her that she did too. And then I said, we make a good pair. And she smiled and said, what a pair. And then we sat for a while, my hand on top of hers, just sitting together, nothing more. And then she turned her head to me and said, I feel lucky. And she said it with more clarity than anything I've heard her say in a long time. And I told her that I felt lucky too, lucky for all that she had added to my life and to the lives of those around her, and that I would always remember what she had taught me. And then she said it again, I feel lucky. And so I asked her if she could tell me why. It was a long pause and then she looked at me with eyes as bright as winter stars and said, because there's love all around. On that Christmas night, I felt something I had not experienced before, that while my time with my mom was still unfinished, our journey was now complete. We had endured our bursts of anger and frustration, but over time, our deep and abiding connection had always held. We had found a kind of steadying. And while the currents of time and age had taken us into territory we'd never imagined, we'd kept traveling. And that journey had carried us to our truest destination as mother and son. It had brought me to the bedside of someone I loved so that I could hear the deepest of all truths that there is love all around. Thank you, Dave. Um, I don't think we need to have any commentary on that. Before we get into the questions um, and everyone, so everyone can also have those words um, in mind, I would like to share a little bit um, some pictures of your mother and your family, just so people can uh, put a name, put a face to a name. So let me do that Thank right you. now. So can I provide a little voiceover comment? Please, comment? everything's captured, but I was hoping, yeah, you might be able to provide some, some yeah. insight. Okay. So in the upper left-hand corner, you see my mom, Adelaide, and my dad, William, on their wedding day in 1942. Um, my dad, as you can see, was in the army then during World War II. Um, and one of the things I relate in the book is the story of their wartime correspondence, the letters my dad wrote to my mom that my mom had saved, which were 
quite extraordinary. Uh, below that are, are two more extraordinary people, um, my principal caregivers, Eileen Khan and, and Sanai Latu, um, just extraordinary, remarkable women. Uh, then my mom, a uh, photograph taken by my dear friend, Laura Hofstetter, who took this uh, photograph of my mom uh, when she was 98. And then a, a, a favorite <laughs> photo of mine, which is uh, uh, my mom on her 103rd uh, birthday in the, the back backyard of, uh, of uh, her house and at the time uh, the house we shared we shared together. Thank you, Dave. So without further ado, we have lots and lots of questions, some great questions. And one I've been dying to ask you since it was asked quite early in the hour, but we have a listener who wants to know if being a caregiver impacted your other relationships, uh, I guess positively or negatively. Her mother is about to move in with her and she's worried about the impact this might have on her relationship with her boyfriend. Yeah, such a great question. And you are so wise to think about that. My situation was different, probably in some ways easier because I moved in with my mom rather than my, having my mom move in with me. At the time I was single, my adult daughter was grown living on the East uh, Coast. Um, I had a significant other in my life, my now wife, Lynn, but we didn't live together at that point. We had separate apartments. So it was easier in that way. Well, I should say it was easier for me. I would not say it was necessarily easier for Lynn. Um, she was incredibly understanding, um, but I, I took that too often for granted. Um, her, and she was, she was patient, uh, but only to a point. I remember one time saying to her, uh, I would, I was a big Stanford fan. My, my dad taught at Stanford. Lynn actually went to Stanford as well. My mom was a huge Stanford fan, biggest fan of all of us. Stanford went to the Rose Bowl one year. And I remember saying to Lynn, oh, this would be so great, but don't you think it'd be great if we could take Adelaide too? Um, because, you know, she hasn't been to the Rose Bowl since 1951. And Lynn said, I hope you two have a nice time. And Lynn is the most tolerant, patient, forgiving person on the planet. So you're wise to ask the question um, and, and think about that and be open and honest about that and keep an open conversation about how that moving, your mom moving in may affect you. Um, everything from bathroom time to, to who's watching what on television, there'll be a lot of adjustments. I still think if you can, it is so worth doing. Um, if, if you can, uh, but it's wise to have your eyes wide open about, about the way it will affect others. Thank you. We have another question from a listener who wanted to know what you did for respite care, what you did to relax, to decompress. Well, I had initially caregivers during my work day. So in some ways work was my respite. I had a, a, a flexible, but, but um, a job I loved, both hosting radio shows on KQED and, and making um, documentary films. Uh, so that in many ways uh, was, was respite. Uh, Lynn would come down and spend a night a week at the Menlo Park house. And she did that for many years until she finally said, you know, why don't you come my way? <laughs> at which point I started taking weekends off. Again, I was incredibly fortunate to be able to afford the care to do that. And over time, I would get a little more care and a little more care. Um, and in the end, it wouldn't, I wouldn't be, um, I'd be remiss if I didn't say the last two years of my mom's life, I cut way back. I was only there two nights a week and parts of four days. Um, I had that much care assistance because I just couldn't do it anymore. It was taking, um, I was, I just couldn't do it anymore. I didn't feel, and I knew that in my heart, and I was so blessed to have Eileen and Sanai be able to pick up and do that for me. And it allowed me to become a son again um, in a way that I hadn't been able to. I'm not even sure I could have had that Christmas moment that I read about if I hadn't been able to, to step away. That was after eight years of caregiving, right? Yeah. 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 Okay. We have another listener who wanted to know Any tips, um, I know from your story, you were 
you were um, kind of an in-person caregiver, but a listener w- wanted to know if you had any tips for long distance caregiving. She has a um, uh, power of attorney for her mother, so she might uh, might have to take a, take a pretty important role, but it's yeah. at this point, it's long distance. Great question. If there are family nearby who can, who can be there and check in, I think that's really important. Having constant communication is really important. Uh, my brothers weren't able to, to be there um, uh, during that time for me, but we stayed in close touch. Um, we talked all the time. Um, I uh, was uh, tried really hard to keep everyone abreast of what was going on. Uh, one brother and sister-in-law did stop in and provide respite care when they could, which was really helpful. Um, all of that, I think, can matter in a long distance to, to, to stay in close touch. Um, and, to, and, and neighbors, too, to have people to be able to check in. I also learned over time that some things work better than others. It helped when I would be away some to, to either use FaceTime or sometimes I would record things for my mom to watch so that she could play them. My, my caregiver could play them and play them again and again. So I'd record little videos and send them to her and so that my mom could play them if I wasn't going to be there. Um, I learned that also in my own uh, family with other people that sometimes FaceTime in those situations can really help. Uh, right now, I'm, I'm, um, my, um, I have a, a, an, an aunt who um, is, I, I sing with um, sometimes um, because she loves to sing and I do too, even though she has a much better voice. So I think doing things like that, which you can do long distance um, can really help a lot. Um, uh, it's, it's, Challenging for sure, but I think figuring out creative ways to stay engaged really matters. Thanks. And I had a question that I myself actually wanted to uh, ask. I know you've had, you've been um, living with a Parkinson's diagnosis since about 2004, and you are married. Uh, I know you have adult children and grandchildren who are approaching the, the tween age. So I was wondering if you yourself being a caregiver and have gone through gone through that journey have you done any kind of specific planning um, be it legal or having discussions about care um, things great of that question. nature yeah great question Calvin you know yes my wife and I both have you know you know both um, wills and and um, you know living wills and advanced care directives um, and uh, all that sort of thing. Um, I think those are really important. In time for my mom, we had uh, a pulse, the physician's order for life-sustaining treatment, which is really helpful too. Um, But it's amazing how much you choose, even given the experience that I've had, that I I sort of like to pretend that, that, well, this couldn't possibly happen to me. Um, So it's thank you for asking that question because I I need to ask it more of myself. I want to say one thing more, which is that one thing I do believe is that an an advanced uh, directive or a, um, a, you know, a living will is not really enough, I don't think. It's not enough to just check a box and say, I don't want extraordinary care or I don't want to be intubated or whatever for two reasons. One, I think we change our minds about these things. My mom was someone who did not want extra help at all um, and up until she was maybe in her late nineties. But from that point on, she made it very clear she wanted to live. And so I was always torn with how do I honor this? Is it the Adelaide I once knew or the Adelaide who is there now? And then you, so you have to start making choices about things, you know, well, are antibiotics extraordinary means? Do we treat, you know, another urinary tract infection? Or if we can keep her comfortable, do we not? So that, you know, these are hard, difficult questions, but people, you know, my mom lived to be 105. People of my generation are gonna be around longer than many who <laughs> the next generation would probably want. So we have to think about these things. And we, I think we have to, one thing I've thought about doing Calvin is writing a letter to my daughter that says, um, here's what I mean by quality of life, that ubiquitous phrase we all use, but don't really define. And for me, it means being able to be with you and with my grandchildren, or with Lynn, with the people I love. It means being able to go for a hike in the woods. It means being able to watch a Stanford basketball game. And if I can keep doing those things, then yeah, I want to live. But if I no longer can, then I really don't. 
you know, some statement like that, that, that where there's more nuance. Maybe you record that like they do on StoryCorps. But I think something like that that would provide more of a, a nuance than just a checked box might be really helpful too. Thanks. And actually, we have a comment from one of our listeners who wanted to mention that after being a long term caregiver for her late, um, I'm sorry, for their late husband, uh, I, don't, uh, I recently documented all the things I would want my kids to do if I should need the kind of care their dad needed. It's just, it was such a relief to put it out there. We had a Zoom meeting to review it all. So, using kind of the technology piece to, to bring everyone together is a great idea. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Looks like we have time for maybe just one more question, and I wanted to maybe include a couple questions at once. One it is um, fairly straightforward. They want to know the book, is it available as an audio book or for large print for people who might have difficulty reading kind of that standard, very small print. And then another listener wanted to know, um, how did the book assist or affect you? Was it... Uh, um, cathartic? Was it a, a, a tribute to your mother? Was it um, was it to raise awareness? Uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you for asking all of those. Um, quickly on the audiobook question, um, it will be an audiobook. It's not there yet, uh, but if that's something I'm determined to do um, for the reasons you suggest. Um, and for me, you know, it's I spent a lot of my life behind a microphone, and so being able to to tell the story is something I would I would very much like to be able to do. So that will happen, but we're not there um, yet. Um, you know, I kept a journal for a lot of my adult life and I did when I was taking care of my mom. For me, that was really useful. It was really a way to sort of try to understand what was happening, try to figure out my own feelings. And it was of course useful when I decided to try to put this book together. It, it was cathartic in the sense that it helped me kind of make sense of the story. And I hope it will resonate with others. Every caregiving story is so individual. This is not a how-to book. It's just a story. It's just a story about my mom and me and some remarkable women. Um, and I hope there are truths in it that resonate with others because I, I believe stories contain truth and we, and we need stories. Um, uh, and um, since the slide is on, I, on the screen, I will say that it, it's, it is now available. It's available through all the usual sources, online sources, but it's also available at your nearest bookstore. If they don't have it in stock right now, you can just ask them to order it. Um, and, 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 I, and I would like to point out, you can see a little tiny print on the screen, perhaps, that all the royalties from the book go to support um, organizations who, um, whose work supports elder care and those living with Parkinson's uh, disease. Um, and so I'm hoping that this book can do a, a little bit of good uh, in that direction as well. Well, thank you very much, Dave. And thank you everybody for joining us today. I know there's lots of interaction, so thanks for your comments. I'll make sure the ones I wasn't able to read out loud, I'll make sure to share them with Dave so he can um, he can hear your thoughts and, and mm -hmm. um, learn about your own your own individual stories. Um, Family Caregiver Alliance webinars, we do these every month. They're free to attend. Next month, we're gonna be talking about advanced care planning. So it should be a, a great topic for pretty much anyone over the age of 18. So if you haven't uh, had those discussions, made those decisions and thought about it, it, it might be a great thing to attend. And that'll be at the end of the month, next month, same time, same day. So again, thank you everyone for joining us. I'm gonna get a quick poll up and I know Dave has a number of um, <laughs> engagements. He's a busy man, busy, uh, has lots, lots to do um, in terms of sharing his story with other people. But uh, I just wanted to mention again, thanks for joining us today. I'm gonna get a quick poll up to um, ask for a little bit of feedback. If you had any time, we certainly appreciate that. So again, thank you all for attending this uh, conversation with Dave Iverson today. And thanks to our special guest, Mr. Dave Iverson. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Calvin, and thanks everyone for being part of this conversation. It's so um, helpful to me, enriching to me to be able to, to share this story and to, and to know that it's connecting with others. So thank you so very, very much for, for, uh, for joining us today. Great, thank you. So the poll is up. If you have a quick moment,
to uh, answer the questions. We'd, be, we'd be certainly love to hear your feedback. And again, um, any comments, I'll make sure to uh, forward them on to Dave so we can see them. So thank you, everybody. Please have a, a safe day and a great day. Thank you. Thank you.